welcome to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Kate Moore Youssef, and I'm a wellbeing and lifestyle coach, EFT practitioner, mum to four kids, and passionate about helping more women to understand and accept their amazing ADHD brains. After speaking to many women just like me, and probably you, I know there is a need for more health and lifestyle support for women newly diagnosed with ADHD. In these conversations, you'll learn from insightful guests, hear new findings and discover powerful perspectives and lifestyle tools to enable you to live your most fulfilled, calm and purposeful life wherever you are on your ADHD journey. Here's today's episode. Hi everyone, welcome back to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. Um, Today we're talking about ADHD and grief and we have um, a wonderful guest in today. You may have heard of her, you may have seen her on Instagram, social media. Her name is Stacey Heal. Um, Stacey was um, diagnosed at the age of 42 and she is a freelance writer. She's a soon to be author. She's got a book in the works, academic and curator who explores the topic of grief and how we deal with it and all the messiness that goes with it and we're going to be talking about her diagnosis but also the process of grieving her husband uh, at the same time so Stacey welcome to the podcast I'm really happy to have you here and as we said just before off mic that we're just going to get into it because I know you've got a really powerful story to tell and I think there's probably going to be a lot of women out there that are going to and men whoever listen whoever is listening and um, will really resonate with um, lots of your story so welcome to the podcast. Hi Kate thank you so much for inviting me on and um, yeah very really happy to get stuck straight into um, all the all the messy stuff. Yeah. So maybe you can just give everyone a little bit of a timeline as to where you are right now. And I guess what has been going on for you over the past few years and what's kind of led you to the book and what you talk about as well. So in terms of the stuff that I talk about very publicly, uh, my husband, Greg, was diagnosed with terminal bowel cancer in 2016 when I was 36 when that happened, he was 39. And we had, at that point, really, really young children, like a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And he lived for five years on treatment the whole time, um, and then died in late 2021. Part of my whole way of dealing with that through all of those years was to write and just connect with other people, because it's a really, it's a really, really lonely place to be. And I found writing so therapeutic and being able to connect with people online in particular. And, and that's kind of carried, that's kind of carried on after, after Greg died. I carried on talking about what it's like, you know, to become a widow in your, I was 41 when I was widowed and having really tiny kids still and what that, what that looks like, what that feels like. And yeah, I'm currently writing a book that is going to be out in May 2024. That's all about, it's not actually about grief. I think people are, people who read my work are probably expecting a book that's all about grief. That's maybe even um, like a memoir or like a kind of a cancer memoir, something like that. But it's not, it's actually a book that's very much about women more kind of universal experiences, not just mine, but about things that we're not told. And of these kind of big shock moments that I've found, probably maybe I would say over the past 10 years of like having children, getting married, uh, watching my husband get ill, watching my husband die, having to live afterwards. Like there's all these things that have come up that are much more universal things that I just didn't know. And 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 then, weirdly, yet another one appeared very shortly after Greg died, which was to suddenly realise that I had ADHD. And that that kind of falls into that same bracket of things that aren't spoken about, things that we don't know, and as we know, and I'm sure all your listeners know as well, about how women... It's not it's not a talked about thing to do with ADHD symptoms mm. and what that actually looks like. So there are all of these women 
who are getting into this midlife stage and suddenly being hit with this realization through more, you know, through your through your podcast, through these different avenues that people are talking about the subject, actually realizing that many of the struggles that they've dealt with their whole life, many of the reasons why they've always thought there was something really terribly wrong with them their whole life. Um, oh, wow. Like, if only someone had talked to me, had talked in general about this, I might have known this earlier and it might have saved a lot of pain. And and that is, that's ultimately what my book is about, is about these different points in women's life where we are probably doing ourselves a, a disservice as well that we need to all talk about things more. And and that's why I, I try to be an advocate for these topics. And, and now that I have been diagnosed, only recently in, my goodness, two months ago, I was only di- diagnosed two months ago, I feel really passionately about advocating for this as a topic as well, because, I mean, the the, the realisations that I've come to and the change in my life is enormous. Yeah. I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing. And, you know, we don't get a rule book for life, do we? We're not handed this book. And I wish we did in some capacity. I wish we did. Yeah, but I hear a lot from (laughs) women who are diagnosed later on in life. And they go, I felt, you know, they say things like, I felt like everyone had this guidebook apart from me. And I was just like winging it and just kind of like every day, just coming up with a new system or a new way of getting through the day. But I can't imagine going through grief, having small kids and having an undiagnosed neurodivergence and all of that, because no one tells you how to grieve. Like you don't know what grief is like until unfortunately you have to be there. And so you're navigating grief, you're navigating motherhood. And I wonder, was there this underlying feeling for a long time that there was something going on that you were thinking or was it kind of a bit like a thunderbolt like oh my god it's ADHD like were there internal questionings going on for a while um well I think I would fall under that category entirely of someone who spent their entire life secretly thinking why does everybody else know what to do and especially as I became an adult and those things that happen when you're an adult of things like buying a house and becoming a mother or just like the mechanics of keeping a home, the kind of things you need to keep on top of. Mm. I was always silently berating myself, just this voice in my head of like, why are you so shit? Like, why are you such a shit adult? And, And that has been on a loop my entire life. Even though if you looked at my life on paper, for example, of being at university and getting really good grades and I have a master's degree and I was a a senior lecturer when I was 30 at university which is really young so I ticked all these boxes of being like super high achiever but I people didn't really see what went on in the background of that like say for example when I was at university in my early 20s I actually left three different universities first I absolutely flunked out of them I started with like gung-ho spirit and then was I two months in oh no I can't do it for this reason the reasons got more and more ridiculous and and then on my fourth go I thought I've really got to fucking do this this time Mm. (laughs) because like because I was just known as this flaky dropout and I hated it I really hated it and The first two years of being at university, I hated. I got really rubbish grades. I didn't go to lessons. And then in my third year, I just zoned in on what I now know is hyper-focus. I came up with this idea and all of my lecturers hated it. They said, this is is really rubbish. (laughs) They were very blunt with me and said, you're going to fail. You can't do this. It's not even about the subject area. I studied fashion and I then wanted to make a film and do this big fine art moment. And um, the whole year they were saying, this isn't going to work. But I was so hyper-focused. I ended up getting the highest grade in the history of the course. I got a double first. Nearly like... I nearly got like a a pure 100%, which was unheard of. Um, That's been my whole life, which is ricocheting between like being an utter fuck up of like starting jobs, quitting on the second day, 
you know, thinking, I'm going to be a Pilates teacher and investing £3,000 and like printing off all, getting all the lovely coloured folders and like laying everything out, starting it and going, ugh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> and then just forgetting about it. And I felt, I feel like it's, yeah, it ricochets from that to kind of me excelling in like a really dramatic, dramatic way. So first of all, I just want to say that I'm nodding away, like literally nodding <laughs> and smiling because I couldn't resonate more with this story. And um, I have my own version, exactly very similar story to you. And I know that so many listeners have this. And what I want to say to you is that when we don't understand it's ADHD, we think we have these like the, this narrative of I'm such a flake. I'm always messing up. I'm always leaving. I can't stick at anything. And it's just this constant sort of self-critical narrative. But then when we understand it's ADHD, and actually I genuinely believe that ADHD is something that we can put into our life of we're great when we're in alignment and everyone should be in alignment. But when we're out of alignment, it's like everything just goes to part. But when we're in alignment, so when you are working in the career, the job that you enjoy, you're studying a degree that you're fascinated by, things go well. But we just have to be really truthful and authentic to who we are. And sometimes we don't know who we are. Sometimes it takes us until our 40s to know what we like and what, and we're not ashamed or embarrassed to demand what we want. Um, and like you say, as women, we're also, I think, conditioned to kind of just go, OK, you know, that's fine. Don't worry. Like, I'll just do what you want me to do. Um, and I think as we talk more about this and we we step into that power that we have to to make choices that are in alignment, that's when we see our ADHD working for us, not against us. But I, I have to say, you know, everything you were just saying, I was the same at uni. I dropped out of my first degree, started another degree. Some of the modules I loved, I like excelled in. And the other ones, I'm just like, I'm not going to that lesson. There's no yeah. way. There's no way I'm showing yeah. up to that lesson because I don't believe in it. And I did the same. I did a dissertation that all my lecturers were like, that's not really a dissertation that we'd, you know, we'd want you to do. But that's what I was interested in. And I said, well, if you want me to do a dissertation, I have to write it about this because that's where you're going to get the, the words on the paper. And so I, I do believe that as we start recognizing what ticks, you know, the boxes for us, that's what we need to start. It's, those, it's like the breadcrumbs is what we need to keep navigating towards. But there's a voice in our heads that tells us that we shouldn't and that's not the way to do things and that's not how other people operate um but I hope that as you know obviously your ADHD diagnosis is very new are you starting to recognize that the when you follow that authentic path for you even if it doesn't make sense to others that's where perhaps you start feeling like things are falling into place I think that that is what's starting to open up in my head. I think I've spent my entire life learning stuff about myself that I'm now trying to unlearn, like these narratives about myself that have been reinforced by other people as well, that I'm dramatic, I'm the drama queen, um, I'm flighty, I don't stick with anything. Oh, what's she doing now? I'm trying to unpick that as well. And actually this diagnosis that it's also recent for me because I wasn't someone who has thought for years oh I've definitely got ADHD I've listened to all of your podcasts and I've heard all these different stories of women over time thinking they ha they've had it for years or they've self-diagnosed and I I literally came to the idea that I might have ADHD probably a few months after Greg died, and it was totally by accident. Um, I was listening to a podcast about divorce. It was um, with a fashion journalist, and she was talking about divorce, and she happened to mention that she had just also been diagnosed with ADHD at uh, in her maybe late 30s, early 40s. And I was on holiday at the time, and me and my parents had taken the girls away because we just needed some space and some time just to kind of after the whole funeral and ev everything that goes on after a death. And I was sat outside on this veranda thinking I was just having this kind of like leisurely time by myself. And it was like being hit by a truck because this woman described me. And I had never, ever thought about ADHD to do with me because I, I think I was very much born in the time of that we've heard many times of 
it doesn't affect girls. It's about little boys bouncing off classroom walls, taking Ritalin. That was my knowledge of what ADHD was, and I never had anything to challenge that. So when I heard all of these examples about how it had shown up for her, I remember walking inside and crying and saying to my mum, I I think I've got ADHD. And for her, she, you know, for the generation before me, was like, what? What are you talking about? And and I I kept all of that very much to myself because I realised that everybody is going to view this through the lens of grief. Everyone is going to think that this isn't real. This is me thinking, oh, there's this thing, this is wrong with me and now I've got to fix it. And so I really kept it very, very quiet to myself and then did probably about 10 months worth of research. I listened to all the podcasts, read all the books, read all the articles about it and was pretty 95% sure that I that I had ADHD. And And then I thought to myself, for me, it was really important that I actually had that recognition. I think one of one of the big things for me throughout my whole life was that I never trusted myself. I always thought that my opinion was wrong or that it was coming from a strange place. And I thought, oh, here's like, I heard that voice. Here she is again. Stacey's come up with this new crazy idea. Oh, now she's got ADHD. And I just thought, I I think I just need a specialist to tell me Mm -hmm. that I'm not going mad. First of all, I went to the GP and asked and just kind of, they were the first people that I spoke to and just thought, I'll just put it out there to see. And it was met with kind of like, again, the moment you say, oh yeah, my husband died last year. Everything is viewed through that lens. And I kind of was like, I don't like, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with that. It's like, I wanted to talk about like when I was 17, like what happened then? Didn't even know Greg then. And like many people will have seen that the NHS waiting lists in my particular area were three years. And I just thought, I can't, I can't do that, actually. And I was lucky in a sense that I had money through Greg's life insurance, that I had a pot that I could... I could seek this privately. It all happened quite quickly. And then in that process of filling out all of the forms and having that interview, I mean, what what a what a mirror to hold up to yourself to hear what other people think about you as well, of how this manifests within you. And even though I kind of knew when I did the the two hour interview with the specialist, when he said to me, You definitely have ADHD you have combined ADHD which I wasn't expecting actually and he said for the inattentive you are off the charts it was still a shock it was still a shock because it's so deeply ingrained in you and I and I think it is very similar to my feelings of grief around Greg's death in that there is this unpacking that needs to happen that it's not something that happens immediately, that there is a very gradual unpacking of your emotions and your thoughts around things. Because it's, say with ADHD, it's been my whole life. And and grieving what, I don't know, maybe not what could have been, because I think thing, things are how they are. That's how things were. And uh, there's a particular period actually of like when I, all of that time, my early twenties with my leaving all those universities and, and during that time I suffered from a very, very serious depressive bout that was all intermingled and I was hospitalized. I was on a very, very crazy concoction of antidepressants and all, well, all sorts of stuff that, that now when I look back, I think that I would never have been put on those if they had known it was ADHD. And I grieve for that girl. Yeah. That girl who was so ill and so confused and lost and had to fight her way back. Um, But actually saying that, it was maybe that period that made me realise that like when Greg was still alive and was ill and we knew he was going to die, that... 
I could do it. No matter how hard it was going to be when he died, I've got proof that I could do it, that I could literally be at a rock bottom place and I could find a way out. Wow. And, and make my life good again. I think anyone can agree that at the moment, modern life can feel pressurised and at any one time, our bodies are dealing with a range of different stresses that could be physical, emotional, biological or environmental and even more so, we feel this with ADHD. So I am delighted that the Herb Tender is sponsoring today's episode. The Herb Tender supplements have been designed with ADHD in mind and they offer a range of different wellness supplements, all formulated with adaptogens and functional mushrooms to help us manage these stresses of modern day living, enabling us to live a healthier, calmer and more focused life. Adaptions help us find equilibrium and possess numerous beneficial powers from reducing stress, aiding sleep, to enhancing focus, performance and immunity. And the Herb Tender supplements also contain powerfully intelligent herbs to help normalise our internal systems, regulate physiological function and restore metabolic balance. I've been taking these supplements regularly now for the past month and I can really notice a difference, which is why I'd love you to give them a go too. And I have a couple of favourites of mine and for anyone with ADHD, um, which are the Focus and Clarity, which have obvious benefits for ADHD brains. And these can be taken in the day whenever you need to just get your head down and focus. I take mine in the morning and I really notice what a productive, um, good few hours I have. And then I have the Calm and Collected, which I take towards the end of the afternoon, in the evening, when I don't need to be productive anymore. I want to encourage more rest and more relaxation. And it really does help us wind down after a very busy day. And it also helps manage anxiety and contributes to better sleep and just makes us feel calmer as well when we wake up in the morning. So I really highly recommend the Calm and Collected. So if you would like to give them a go, the Herb Tender is offering us a 20% discount. So if you head to the-herbtender.com, so that's the-herbtender.com, and you type in the discount code KATEMORE20, so that's K A T E. M-O-R-E 20, Kate Moore 20, you will get 20% off any supplements on the website. I really would recommend giving them a go. And even if you just want to try the Focus and Clarity and the Calm Collector just to get you started, I would definitely recommend these. Now back to today's episode. Just going back a little bit when you said about not trusting yourself and then believing that you're going to get gaslighted again by a doctor and, you know, obviously you didn't want to say anything to anyone and maybe your mum's reaction as well of, of just not understanding, so maybe dismissing and then sort of saying and you're glossing over it, saying it's all part of the grieving process. Again, this fear of being, of not trusting ourselves and then having this massive moment of realization that ADHD has been with us you know since we're kids but then fearing what people are going to say fearing the judgment fearing the dismissal the invalidation it's so difficult because that's so part of it if there was any other diagnosis you know I think people think with ADHD and I, and I was very nervous and worried to come out and talk about it and I really guarded it and did exactly what you did and did loads of research and really kind of internalized it but then I would get that mirror back from other people going, really, you? I don't think so. Like, you're totally organised. Your house is always tidy. But you just, un unless you understand ADHD so, um, I'd say delicately, in the sense that it goes on so internally with women, especially, that there's no way, unless you are incredibly hyperactive and disorganised and outwardly sort of dysfunctional, People and uh, people aren't going to really kind of go, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, put you down as ADHD straight away. So you have to go to that extra effort and that exhausting way of trying to explain to people and you don't want to have to. And then you're going through the process of grief as well. I can't imagine how exhausting that must have been for you. And did you curate a number of people who you allowed in, like that very sort of tight inner circle where you could share um, because you're, I can only imagine that grief as well, there's so much internalization and I'm happy for you that you had this creative outlet that you could write and, um, and I read your posts on Instagram and they're so emotive and beautiful and heartfelt, but heartbreaking as well. That, did you feel that you could go there with the ADHD as well? Or did it feel easier to talk about the grief? Because people could relate to the grief maybe more. I think there are similarities actually between the two in that both 
ADHD and grief, I think the general population probably have a very, very surface level understanding of both. And I think it's one, both of those things are areas where you kind of, you don't know till you know. And we've kind of got these general understandings about both. None of them show the real nuance or the depth of of both of these things. And when I started to tell people, even people in my inner circle said, I think either, they either said, some people accepted it. Some people said, I don't think you've got it. And again, that's from, uh, I'm like, are you a psych- psychologist? <laughs> are you like, what research have you done about this? But it, it, again, it's about that surface level, but we think we know about it. And then other people had said to me, when I explained it, they said, but isn't that just everyone? Everybody is hectic. Everybody isn't up together with things. And again, it's that surface level. And grief is really, really similar to that in that people um, have a really surface level understanding, thinking that it's probably to do with sadness. And the there's a real there's a very linear way of dealing with it, that it kind of starts really, really bad. Like day one is the worst. And then as you tick on through the days, it gradually gets better. Sadness kind of lifts. But actually, I think the the, the reason I've started to write about it is to show the real intricacies and madness of it, of what that looks like. And that has definitely resonated with people who know, but I kind of want to talk not to the people who know, but about about the people who don't know. I mean, the difference with ADHD and grief is obviously that we, all of us, are going to grieve in our lives. That's, That's just a fact. And multiple times for different things, different people. Not everyone is going to experience ADHD themselves. They're not going to know what that feels like in your head. And even if they had a family member... Um, maybe when if someone was going through the diagnosis of their child, maybe that you can see it from a perspective, but you don't know what it you still don't know what it feels like mm. on the inside. Um, yeah, I, I must admit, I don't think I've gone too, too far into talking about ADHD yet. Yeah, that's not to say that I won't. But I think because it's so it's so new for me. Um me kind of then initially speaking to the doctor and then the diagnosis was so quick that I mean that's the lucky the good thing about paying for it is that it is very quick and it's so unfortunate that other people have the weight because that must be torturous absolutely torturous for people and it wouldn't necessarily happen if it was anything else that's I mean anything very physical yeah obviously like mental health wait lists are obscene as well um but yeah I think I need a bit more time to almost digest a little bit of what's going on with the ADHD stuff for me because I mean that is also the thing of the timing of this as well that because everything that's go, you know it's only been 18 months since Greg died and I'm dealing with all sorts of stuff that's still coming up and stuff with my girls as well there's a lot going on and I I almost felt like I was diagnosed and then kind of went Right, great, that's done. Right, what are we doing next? <laughs> what are we doing next? Because everything I'm doing, like as a solo parent, is is so busy that I don't really feel like I've had a chance to really think about it yeah. and de- deconstruct what this actually means for me. Maybe that's going to come out in your writing, you know, in, in different capacities and different chapters that are just, just going to come out and you're going to deconstruct it in that way. I wanted to ask how you've dealt with your husband's death, with Greg's death, where from a logistical, you know, executive functioning side, because I know that a massive fear for a lot of people who have partners, and I, and I don't know what Greg was like, but was he the person that would deal with the paperwork? Was he the person that was the very neurotypical person in the relationship? Or was, was there elements of neurodivergence there? Because a lot of us gravitate towards that person that is the support, the scaffolding, and then we fear this this terrible fear that if something happens to them, we're going to be like this shit adult that can't do anything. And I just wondered how you've navigated that. 
Um, weirdly, no. That's actually the opposite of what Greg was. I don't think Greg had any neurodivergence, um, but what he was was a archetypal artist. He was a musician and a fine artist, and he was that kind of space cadet artist that lives in the stars. So weirdly, in our relationship, in our house, I was the one who did all the paperwork. I was the one who organized everything which actually was bananas <laughs> because like I I am not so good at that stuff so really things didn't work like in terms of like the mechanics of the house it was clunky clunky like to do with the kids as well um but I think for me my ADHD symptoms that I can now see like really ramped up when he died and suddenly I don't know, like, maybe because he was like how he was, it kind of forced me into a lot of situations. Well, after he died, like, suddenly there's all this stuff to do and I couldn't do any of it. And and that is a grief thing as well, like that kind of immobility, that, that shock that sets in. But also, um, yeah, all of that executive function stuff just came hard and fast. And still to this day, um, 18 months later, I have only just cancelled his f- phone contract. And that's not through any kind of um, reason of like, oh, I still want to be able to like text him or like it's too it's too stressful to do it. It was just like, oh, my God, I just I, I, I just can't understand how to do this. Um, I've only just cancelled his bank account. I mean, I can't tell you of all the paperwork that I haven't done to do with his death. There is so much paperwork after someone dies. And it feels like a cruel joke to anybody of like, here's the worst time of your life. Now you suddenly have to become some kind of PA for them to deal with the closing of their life. And it's hard. And if you have those issues with those things, it's pretty impossible actually impossible so and there's the payoff to that of like I mean I don't even want to think about so which is why I'm not doing it of like what happens when I actually do contact these people how much like am I gonna owe them money potentially have I lost money probably yeah so I think my life would probably have been easier if I'd have gravitated to someone who who could kind of plug those gaps for me it's prepared you I guess because you it's in that sense that you've <laughs> yeah. not had to be like oh my god it's all on me now like it was you anyway yes yeah and actually no you're you're correct about that definitely that it's not just me I was always that person that did it so it's not this horrific shock and I worry for 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 women in particular not necessarily people who have ADHD but this would affect them more of Women who whose husbands are the people who deal with the money, who know the passwords, who deal with the paperwork. And if they die, what happens then? Like, you don't know how anything in your life functions. And that's very terrifying, I think, for women in general. So I would suggest that even if you find it hard, find a way to kind of boil that down with your partner so at least you know where your assets are, what the password is to get into your bank account. I know many people that have been fucked because of it, because they didn't have that. And yeah, if you're dealing with ADHD or any neurodivergence on top of that, it makes things so much harder. Yeah. And that is, it's actually a very real worry for quite a lot of people where they know that they are reliant on that neurotypical person. That neurotypical person is the executive functioning in the relationship and the bank stuff, the tax stuff, the invoices, the mortgage, all things like that, you know, with them because they find it easier. And then we just kind of bury our heads in the sand. and, And if that's easier, then we'll just, you know, do that. But there is a very real fear there that, and I think we have to kind of almost broach that fear because you're right. It's no one wants to be in that situation where you can't access the things that, you know, you deserve. But it was just making me think that, um, when you're talking about all the admin side of it because also you're you just are not able to think and um I actually one of the things I asked my friends to do actually after Greg died was write me a list 
Write me a list of everything and every person you can think of that I am going to need to contact. Um, and that was really that was really helpful. But I think what you also need to do is, yeah, that kind of body doubling thing that I know that helps. That helps me massively. Definitely. Having someone to sit down with me and go, right, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And like break it down. Because I can't imagine how overwhelming that must have been. Oh, oh, uh, <sighs> awful 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 and I think also then I didn't really know I didn't know about my ADHD then when I was doing that and I just that voice in my head of like everyone else is doing this everyone else can sort this stuff out why can't you sort this out why are you avoiding this um and dealing with the grief as well like that initial grief was was so hard of those two things together so you know you're obviously now writing a book. I want to just go back to the beginning of the conversation, what you said about the things that we didn't know. Is there anything coming to mind? I mean, I can think of all sorts of things that my mum just didn't and doesn't talk about that I wish I'd known. And I know for a fact that my ADHD comes from my mum. Oh, really? Yeah. Has she been diagnosed she's or been, is this something? Di no, she's not been diagnosed, but she says it and we see she, it. She agrees. She's, she agrees. She talks okay. about it. She goes, well, I can't do that because I know that my concentration can't do that or I can't do that because that really overwhelms me. But she comes from sort of quite a deficit approach where it's very negative. And I try and come now a little bit more with, with the awareness and the education and acknowledgement of just tweaking our lives and understanding what makes us tick and sort of reaching for those strengths. ADHD is like really strong in my family. I've got siblings with it and I can, you know, we can really go back to sort of grandparents and stuff and see where it shows up. But she just didn't tell me anything. And she, you know, I don't know when she went on HRT. I don't know when she went through menopause. I've had to ask her. I didn't, I don't know anything because she just, she's from that generation where we just don't talk about things unless someone prods us for it. And I think now, like you say, we have to, the next generation of girls and women, they have to know this stuff. We don't want a surprise. We don't want to kind of, um, sometimes we do have to figure these things out on our own. We do. But sometimes it'd be great to have a bit of a heads up, I think. And I just wonder if, if, if what you're planning on talking about in the book about those different things. Oh, my God, where do I start? Well, the whole, the conception of the book came from, I would probably say, the last six weeks of Greg's life, where he was told that he was, that he was in the active process of dying. Um, and that he would die. He was told at that point it would be a few weeks, but he actually ended up living for six. And in that time, it was very, very otherworldly. It, it was like literally walking through a door in your house that you've always lived in, that you've never seen before, into like another dimension. And I was so unprepared for it. it and, and that's strange because... I have I had spent pretty much his whole illness of five years writing about death, um, working with a death doula. That now that's a thing. Yeah. That's actually something that exists, and it's someone who who kind of tries to prepare you for it. Um, I had been in therapy every single week for five years to kind of come to terms with it about what was going to happen. I'd worked with different charities, and still. It just felt like the world's best kept secret of what does it look like when someone dies? There was so much every single day that was happening, whether that was physically with Greg or that was emotionally coming up or the terms, you know, medication to do with like the palliative care team. It was every single day I felt like in shock of like, what's this now? What's I've got no idea what this is. What does this mean? And I was furious. I was so angry at the world, the whole world, for for not prepping us. I was like, we're, we're all going to go through this. We're all going to go through this potentially many, many times to be with people who are dying. And And I felt like I really, really wanted people to know what that actually looks like. And what I felt and what questions I had. And yeah, and then that kind of sprang up other things of what else have I really been confused about? And 
I wanted to talk about illness as well. What does what does illness look like? We don't really like talking about illness as as a whole. And what does that look like? What does a marriage look like when one person is really ill? What does marriage look like really as well? I felt like as young women, we talked a lot about relationships and what could be ahead of marriage and children. And then I found, I found that, and talking to other people as well, that when you got to a certain age or maybe a certain point in your, your steady relationship that turned into a marriage, that people just stopped talking about it. And so no one really knows what goes on and what's normal and what's not okay and what are the kind of problems that people have after they've been together 15 years. What does that look like? Yeah, uh, one of the things I I want to talk about that I've never talked about publicly, but I want to talk about in the book just because it's a much better vehicle for the subject is to talk about some of the difficulties me and Greg had in our relationship about how the narrative is there's like this roll of the dice which has meant one of you's going to die and you think that that's just going to bring you together and everything's will just kind of be this almost like this Romeo and Juliet situation of like in it to the end and we're we're kind of like clinging to each other and and it was like that probably for a very small amount of time, maybe some months. And then things really kind of disintegrated in many, many ways. And because that felt to me, again, like something that I just didn't know about, that what does marriage look like? What is the detail? I think that's that's for me is the thing of like, I don't want to write a book that's about broad strokes or we communicate so much on social media for example I feel like we're always bloody communicating there's like we're either reading stuff we're taking in the hot takes we're taking in five ways to blah blah blah. it's all this kind of like really instant stuff this information that we're taking in or, or we're putting that out into the world as well our own takes on things but it's all got to be so small and and boiled down and like, okay, summarise it. Summarise this experience in like one sentence. And and that's why I've never talked about it publicly online is because, I mean, I don't even know if I can do it justice in a book, to be honest, because it is so nuanced mm-hmm. and complex and complicated. And, and also, like, I'm really aware that I'm only one side of this. Like, I, you can't even get Greg's side in it his truth of this would be very different to mine. I can't even talk to him about it. So I feel like, and you know, it goes back to the ADHD thing of really wanting to give people a much more in-depth, detailed look about what this actually looks like. Yeah. It's so powerful what you're talking about. And I'm listening to you and thinking, we do need to have these very difficult conversations. Women need to hear them because we don't, you know, we now know that normal is just not a barometer to live by and everyone experiences different things things through different lenses. And like you say, our experience is different to our partner's experience. And we don't, we never know what's going on in people's heads. Like we really, no matter if you've been married to someone for 40 years, you still don't know what's going on inside their heads. But then you throw in, the, the the complexities of 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 a life threatening illness and being a carer and knowing that there's death um you know around the corner and all these different things and you're then you're mothering two small children I can only imagine that the parenting was on you during those times as well and having blame or anger resentment and all those things that you think that maybe as a woman we are just born to be nurses and we've got to have compassion and and care and and actually I can understand that must have been anger there and disappointment and all the things that we weren't expecting this this wasn't our future and and you're then navigating that and I just want to just be thank you for your honesty Thank you for your vulnerability and also to say that I think this book is very much needed and um, a lot of people are going to be grateful for it because the more honest and truthful conversations that we can have and that's why I feel so strongly about this podcast because 
for the first time ever, a lot of women are listening to this and going, finally, someone's saying something that I've been too afraid to admit or I've been too afraid to talk about. I don't have anyone that can I can have this conversation with. And that in turn makes people feel less alone. And I hope that as you talk about all these things and, and you become braver and, and more courageous and, and you really sort of share your truth, that you'll create a community around you of women who um, I know that you're probably going to be helping a lot of people. I just want to thank you so much for your story. And I know that you have so much more to offer. Can you tell us a little bit more about the future, what your plans are? Have you got any, I mean, I know that a book is all consuming. Um, I guess what's your, your next few months? To, to write the book <laughs> I know when it's uh, I know I have started it don't worry but um I tell you what ADHD uh, procrastination is real yeah. I've just got to um not suddenly go ah like what do you, um uh like th- like thinking about the most random question and thinking I must research that I must spend two hours researching that. That's so important. Yeah, um, yeah I'm. I, yeah, ultimately, I need to write the book. Um, I everything kind of hinges on that at the moment. My plan really is I want to kind of what you said, which is start some kind of community to do very much to do with women, not just to do with grief, but really those foundations that the book is going to be based on, which is about how we talk to each other. And it is about that, that kinship and I suppose sisterhood of, of the more we talk about things, the more supported that we can feel. Yeah. And I don't totally know what that's going to look like yet. Um, I would love to do a book retreat to kind of have women all together to talk about stuff. Um, yeah, that's my that's my slightly long term plan. I like that idea, and I think I would absolutely love to have you back when the book's written and we oh. can talk about the book and we can reflect oh, back on this conversation <laughs> and see what went in, what didn't, what it's, angles. It's a, it's it's at the point at the moment where I I genuinely feel like I don't know how it's going to be written. I don't know how I'm going to manage it, but I must remember it is also like I need to get it into hyper focus. Um, territory of be like this is what you want to do so you've just got to go for it yeah um, yeah and it the, will and happen the truth is if you've got a deadline um with our ADHD brains we work very well last minute and I hear a lot of people yes, say that's true oh you know I, I shouldn't work last minute and I shouldn't wait stay up all night writing and I think well you know what lean into the way your brain wants to work and if you are going to batter out 500 pages in three days and that's how your brain works um then do it and don't feel like you need to kind of like oh this is what this writer does and she writes um a chapter you know a week or something like if that doesn't work for you just drop the story and do what do what works for you and you don't have to sort of conform to sort of typical writing patterns if if that doesn't work for you because the book will get written it might be at the detriment of your nervous system but the book- <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i think this is i mean this is nothing new to me this is how i've worked my whole life yes. which is kind of like stop start stop start stop start ah but i think the difference is that now that i've had the diagnosis I'm just nowhere near as hard on myself. Great. Like the the functionality of myself hasn't changed, but that voice berating myself has has nearly gone, I would say. Amazing. Well, Stacey, thank you so, so much. Um, I will put all your details in in the show notes. Um, and if people want to follow you on social media, how how will they find you? Uh my um my name on Instagram is Stacey underscore heal h-e-a-l-e fantastic and i look forward to the book and i'll definitely get you back to talk about it when it's out brilliant i'd love to thank you kate thank you so much for joining me on today's episode i hope you found what you were looking for in this conversation and it's helped guide you towards some further self-healing self-exploration and most importantly self-acceptance and if you have enjoyed this conversation and would like to experience more of my work such as access to exclusive live workshops and opportunities for group coaching sessions, connecting with other like-minded women and a general feeling of belonging, please come and check out my monthly membership, the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Collective. 
I've made it as affordable as possible and I offer you lots of resources and opportunities for connection and support from other women all around the world being diagnosed with ADHD later on in life. I'd absolutely love to see you there. All the details are in this episode's show notes or on my website, adhdwomenswellbeing.co.uk. See you in the next episode.